Um, thank you for joining everyone. Um, it's one minute past 12.30, so I think we're ready to go. So welcome to the third instalment of our 2023 In Conversation With series, organised by the GDST alumni team to bring together alumni, current students, parents and other GDST family members and showcase the achievement of a range of our alumni. We're very honoured today to have Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh with us, Portsmouth High School alumna and finalist of the GDST's 2022 Alumna of the Year competition. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Lorraine. So Lorraine is an environmental psychologist focused on public engagement with climate change, energy and transport. She's currently Professor of Environmental Psychology at the University of Bath and has led the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformation for four years. Her research projects include studies into meat consumption, energy efficiency behaviours, waste reduction and carrier bag reuse, perceptions of smart technologies and electric vehicles and low carbon lifestyles. In 2021, Lorraine joined the Climate Crisis Advisory Group led by former government chief scientific advisor, Sir David King, advising policymakers on the climate crisis and the net zero transition. She's a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and regularly advises governmental and other organisations. She's also worked with city councils to design interventions that encourage low carbon travel and was involved with the Climate Assembly UK, a citizen service engagement process that looked to take public opinion on climate change to the government of the UK. Finally, last year, she was awarded an MBE in the Queen's New Year's Honours in recognition of the work she has led on behaviour change and public engagement towards more sustainable futures, following the UK's successful hosting of COP26 in 21. She also made a call for more women in the discussion at the conference as she's passionate about female leadership around climate change. Absolutely impressive uh, biography there, Lorraine. So let's get back to the beginning of your story. Can you tell me a little bit about your school days here at Portsmouth High School? We just chatted about the fact that you walked past the school, but you haven't been back in yet. Uh, what part did the school play in nurturing this interest in environmental issues? And if any, did it all start here? Oh yeah, well, so lovely to be chatting with you, Jane. And yes, I think it looks like things have changed a bit since since my days. And um, uh, I still come back to Portsmouth to visit to visit my mum. But uh, yeah, I'd love to kind of come and see the school at, at some point. But yeah, thinking back to my time, I think there was definitely a growing awareness of the environment amongst my friends um, when I was at the high school. And I do remember learning in geography there about things like deforestation and seeing some of the images of environmental degradation that were you know, becoming much more sort of there was just rising public awareness, I think, of the environment at that time. Um, and for the work experience that the school organised for me, um, I spent time in the, the, the planning department at the city council. And one of the things I definitely remember being really important in their work was actually um, their challenges around kind of preserving green space in what is one of the most densely populated cities in Europe. So I think I think all of those things sort of left a bit of a mark. And, and then it was kind of really at university when I think sort of some, some of the Kind of potential to work in in environment really became clear but i think one of the other things that was really significant during my time at the high school was um the sort of humanities subjects that i was taught and that really inspired an interest in me um around kind of what people believe so we had a great uh, we had great religious studies teachers so mrs ty ford for example was fantastic um and it was because of them that I chose to study theology and religious studies at university. So not, not environment actually, um, initially. Um, and that was really because I was so interested in sort of different belief systems and um, kind of what influenced people's sort of decision-making, I suppose. So, um, and then sort of in my master's and PhD, looked more at kind of how those belief systems impact on the environment so I think there were sort of a couple of things that definitely started to spark an interest not just in the environment but actually in people and how kind of people act and what drives sort of people's different belief systems that that was, was sparked at the high school. 
And not many people realise just how densely populated Portsmouth is. But you were aware of that as a school girl walking backwards and forwards between home and school even then. Although we do have, as you say, quite a lot of green spaces within that urban setting. So you've mentioned some teachers that were role models uh, whilst you were growing up. Were there others? Yeah, I mean, I think sort of my dad was was definitely a role model. He he was a professor of environmental economics um, at the University of Portsmouth, and he was a, a really amazing educator and teacher. And he would just love the opportunity to explain complex things. And it was the teaching, I think, that really kind of um, uh, sort of inspired him to get into higher education. And but also, you know, he he was curious. He was he was a researcher as well, and I loved going into the university with him to like just sort of sit and colour in and stuff when I was very little. And I think kind of really seeing the sort of work he did inspired me to get into higher education. Um, so I think I think yeah, his his influence was really significant as well. Once I got to university as well, there were some really great um, teachers as well. I had a there was a professor Robin Gill at um, Kent University who taught us a module on science, religion and nature. Um, and so really opened my eyes to kind of how different belief systems and you could say sort of scientific, you know, the scientific worldview is, is a, in a sense, a way of seeing the world in, a, in the way that sort of religious beliefs are a way of seeing the world and how those different, um, those different lenses really can come together in different ways and how we see ourselves in relation to nature can be very different and, and impact on our behavior. So I think there was sort of some really great sort of university uh, teachers as well that, that shaped me. And you talked about going off to study initially theology. Was there a particular moment or situation that led to your decision to have a career in environmental psychology? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it came in stages because it's not sort of a very well-known discipline. So I don't think sort of from an early uh, year, age, I, I kind of knew that that was a career sort of path. But I knew, as I say, early on, I probably wanted to be a researcher. I was sort of love finding things out and I found it really interesting, kind of like, why do people believe what they believe? Um, and I really wanted to do research that sort of made a difference. And um, after I did my, my master's, I actually spent some time working as a researcher in guide dogs for the blind um, as a researcher and trying to um, understand the impact that guide dogs have on their owners, mobility and independence and confidence. Um, and so I loved I loved doing the research, but I kind of realized that to get into a research career, it helps to have a PhD. And so I applied for funding to go back to university at Bath uh, to uh, study. Well, at the time, it was sort of people's beliefs about nature. I was going to sort of focus on that. And then I realized, oh, there's actually a sort of specialism here. There is a thing called environmental psychology, which is sort of the study of people's relationship with the environment. Um, uh, and this is a sort of growing area of psychology, actually, and realized there were conferences and journals and sort of a community of researchers working in this area that I could sort of be part of. So I think then that sort of started me in, um, along a, a route where I found an identity, essentially. I like, ah, there's a name for the sorts of things I'm interested in. It's in Roman psychology. Um, and so then sort of specialized in that area, essentially. And I think I know the answer to this, though. But what's the best part? of your job of the role you do now um I'd say there's sort of two two best bits probably the the main one really is the fact that I I get to speak to policy makers and kind of engage with people that are making uh, like actually creating policies and making decisions um and so kind of you know being in the room I suppose with influential people and trying to say here is some evidence that might be relevant to what you're trying to do on climate change um, so last year I was a, a special advisor to the House of Lords um, on their inquiry into behaviour change um, for environmental goals um, and it gave a really brilliant insight into how government and parliament work in a way that I just had not sort of been able to see before um, and feeling like just in a tiny little way that I was sort of able to contribute to improving climate policy um, in the UK and there's still a long way to go and I mean I see probably more barriers than I see opportunities but still that feeling that actually working with policymakers, you might sort of be able to, to have a bit of an impact and we're working with Welsh and Scottish governments as well and, and it sort of feels like you know you're actually making can make a bit more of a difference maybe at that level um, sometimes too. I think the other thing is probably 
working with early career researchers, so people that are just starting out on their career. Um, so supervising PhD students, for example, we've got some incredibly talented students um, at, at our university who are just starting out getting into PhDs and things and seeing their enthusiasm, seeing their, their like huge talent and, and, it, um, and the motivation really to, to work in this area is, is really inspiring. And then just sort of feeling like I can, so maybe help them a little bit and kind of watch them develop is also really nice. So, so that's a, yeah, that's another nice bit of the job. The bits I don't like are things like exam marking and like looking at spreadsheets to manage grants. <laughs> I thought you might say marking. I think that's the job most, <laughs> most teachers um, are not so keen on. The best bit is always working with the young people and, and bringing that next generation forward. You talked a little bit about some of the prominent and international independent groups of experts that you work with. Is there any particular group that you think are affecting the most amount of change through the world? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, so young people are definitely making a difference. And I think we've seen that in, with school strikes and um, uh, uh, and the sort of just the fact that that young people are using their voice in different ways through what they buy, as well as kind of, you know, protesting and taking to the streets and, you know, what they're, you know, who they're voting for and um, and in the, what they do within their organisations, they are coming, I think, probably to you in the same way that they are to sort of the leaders of the university to say, you know, we should be doing more. What are you doing? Why are you not kind of taking more action? So I think young people are really an important impetus for the sorts of change that we're seeing. Um, and um, but I think kind of actually what's clear from our work is that everybody in different ways have have um have impact or, or ca can make a difference in the things um in in various different ways in terms of climate change so some of the times we're sort of it seems like well all we can do is maybe just buy you know buy green things or maybe save energy at home those are definitely great things we can do to directly reduce our carbon footprint but actually all of us have a voice in different ways so we can yeah we can vote for parties that are doing more on climate change we can speak to our employer we can um, just have a conversation with somebody you know in our community and saying like you know I'm a bit worried about climate change what are you doing and all um, so we can all actually make a difference so I think that's part of our work is trying to make that message a bit clearer is because I think otherwise people feel quite disempowered with something like climate change so it is about sort of showing we can all do something um, but yeah young people definitely are I think are a particularly powerful force in in, in that well, I can certainly echo that because the pupils we have within this school, the students, uh, very much use their voice. And so we have had things like Meet Food Mondays and so on to um, work towards becoming more carbon neutral, more environmentally aware, more sustainable as a school. And in fact, on Thursday, we're walking along the seafront and back, which is actually 10 kilometres. The walk we've been doing for uh, quite a few years, it started off as a walk to represent how far women, young girls walk in parts of Africa to get water. Um, but in fact, this one, this walk on Thursday, we're doing for One Tree, who are a charity that plant trees to offset your impact on the environment. And um, that's why we're raising money for this particular organization. I think the whole trust is actually trying to support One Tree and certainly we're doing it on Thursday, because we are aware of the impact that we're making through school trips, and we talked about, you know, the cost to the environment of um, air travel. So if we're looking into the future, and we're aiming for a fully sustainable world, when and if ever will we get there? What can we do to make ourselves get there a little faster? I think... Well, we're already on that journey, and and so there's sort of that that's almost the, sort of the good news, really, is that although we've got quite a long way to go, we are making some progress. Um, it is about social transformation, actually. I think I think sometimes it's not. I don't think it's really made clear to the wider public just how much change we're going to have to undergo to to address climate change, and how much the world is just going to change because of the impacts. I, I did. Um, uh, an, an event the other day actually um, with somebody who's written a book about climate migration and the fact that actually we're talking about literally billions of people migrating around the world from particularly sort of hotter countries to to northern latitudes where 
it's going to be the only places that are going to be livable within a matter of like two or three decades. So we're talking about in the very near future. So the scale of change that we're that we're going to see is, is huge. And so we need to really transform and have some pretty radical social and technological changes. So you'll be aware sort of, you know, obviously electric vehicles are being rolled out and lots of people are adopting that uh, uh, technology. Heat pumps are going to be coming into people's homes. There'll be things like new protein sources so that sorts of foods that we eat are going to probably be, be different so that we're less reliant on particularly red meat and dairy. Um, but there'll be wider lifestyle changes. So we talked about travel. So I think flying is one of the really difficult ones because we don't yet have a technological solution. There's no sort of low carbon um, airplanes yet, but uh, hopefully there, there, there might be. But in the meantime, we are going to have to just fly less, much less, um, drive less and consume differently as well. So hold on to things for longer. So buy second hand and uh, repair things, give things away when we don't want them. And so, so keep things in circulation for much longer rather than buying new all the time and kind of disposable things. So thinking about being less wasteful, I think, is really important but we're already seeing some progress in that area we're doing more virtual communication like this um uh, so i think there is progress people are changing their diet as well so we know that meat consumption has come down people you know veganism and vegetarianism are on the rise um so people want to eat more sustainably and healthily actually so there are encouraging signs but it is we're really at the beginning of this process and we are going to need a lot more change. So you might have caught the news last week that the World Meteorological Organization um, have calculated that we're probably going to um, go, uh, go past 1.5 degrees warming in the next couple of years. And this is the sort of considered the safe-ish um, warming limit that we were trying to keep within. So we're almost certainly going to breach that limit which is a bit scary when we think about kind of what hotter um, temperatures mean for people and we also know that the scale of our carbon footprint needs to come down in the UK we've got a carbon footprint of about eight and a half tons of CO2 per person that needs to come down to two and a half tons in the next six and a half seven years like 2030 so huge amounts of change but actually hopefully a lot of those things will improve our lives in many ways so it's tempting to sort of think about you know going green as meaning sacrifice but actually it can mean lower energy bills you've mentioned you've got solar panels on the roofs on the roof there so that's helping reduce um energy bills and save money if we hold on to things for longer then we're not buying so much stuff which saves us money um walking and cycling instead of driving is obviously much healthier plant-based diets tend to be healthier so there is lots of sort of reasons why we might, might want to do these things anyway actually but we do have to sort of accelerate the pace of change so we so so the question when is kind of as soon as possible basically and i hope that we're supposed to be at sort of net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest i hope i really hope we get there i think we're i think we're making progress but we need to accelerate that change it's difficult, isn't it, though, to change the habits that people have got into. If I think back to when I was a child, we only ate certain vegetables and fruits at certain times of the year, whereas now we're so used to being able to have strawberries all year round, wherever they've come in from, and other vegetables and fruits and so on. And it's it's changing people's attitude to that and expectations, I suppose. Um, in our prep school, we do have a Christmas jumper swap, so they don't buy Christmas jumpers new every year to wear for sort of one day. They swap them around just before it's Christmas jumper day. So it, it's small, but there is quite a bit of the um, switch going on, as they call it, for clothes and so on. And I know a lot of our students do actually sell a lot of their clothes on vintage and then buy clothes back off that. So they're not always buying new uh, and repairing things is, is becoming better. But we're like you say, we've still got a huge way to go. Yeah. So last year you were awarded an MBE in recognition for your work. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how you felt to receive such a prestigious award? Yes, it still feels a bit surreal, like maybe they made a mistake somewhere in the paperwork. But um, and, and actually, that was my first reaction when I got the 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 letter. I thought this must be a hoax, because actually the way it was worded as well, it was sort of we've been struggling to get hold of you. It's now really urgent. If we don't hear from you at the end of the week, by the end of the week, we'll just have to decide that, you know, that you, you're not interested. And I thought, oh, this is classic sort of hoax territory. Put all the 
pressure on I've got to make and so I thought well I'll, I'll phone the number on here and just sort of see see what this is all about and such a lovely lady answered and said oh yes dear it is real yes a, a lot of people phone us to check <laughs> and she said but congratulations and so and then I yeah I just sort of thought well this is absolutely incredible and I still sort of think you know I feel really sort of honored and I think it I, I can always I keep thinking about sort of all the people that are more worthy really of getting this but I hope it's sort of I, I like to think of it as maybe a recognition of the field and the fact that our centre for example is doing great things and so it's a sort of collective recognition of that work and so I'm, I'm yeah hugely sort of grateful to, to colleagues and the researchers in, um, that I work with because they're doing sort of all the hard work really so yeah so, so it was amazing and then we got an opportunity to actually meet the king uh, this year so um it was we got uh my husband and my my children came uh, with me to Windsor Castle and we met the king and it was all hugely surreal and but just amazing so um yeah it was it was really really wonderful so I still feel like uh they, they made a mistake but it was it was it's lovely <laughs> thinking that it can't be yours is as you will know called imposter syndrome when you feel that this can't be real because it can't be happening to me what what do you think about female leadership particularly in the area that you work are, are there many other female leaders or are you very much pioneering that um, I think in psychology, actually, it is a very um, popular subject amongst uh, young women and, and girls. So actually, what we see, our, our undergraduates, for example, are, are mostly women, and we've got only a few percentage that are, are men. Um, then as you as you sort of go up the career pr pr ladder, um, it sort of evens out and then there's a lot more male professors than there are female but it is starting to to the balance is starting to be redressed so I so I'm certainly not unusual now to be um a female psychology professor but in sort of in I, but, but because sort of environmental psychology is quite an interdisciplinary area and so we're working with engineers and and climate scientists and modelers and various other groups who are quite a lot more sort of male dominated um I sort of sometimes I'm I'm a bit sort of um I might be sort of the only only woman in the room but um and that can feel sort of yeah I'm sort of aware of that and I think the confidence it has been it's taken quite a while for the confidence to come and to sort of feel like I do actually have something to contribute here and I won't just defer to everybody else so it's it, it's been it's been a process and I still sort of feel sometimes like oh my goodness I've stepped into the wrong room here but um yeah, uh, it, it's taken a while, but I, I think, yeah, things are changing. And I think there is an awareness of sort of equality, diversity, inclusion and things. And so more and more, I think, you know, I I, I think there's sort of um, a, 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 a desire to have more diversity. So that kind of helps helps a bit. So thinking back over all your amazing successes, what do you think has been the most challenging aspect of your career? And how did you overcome that? Now, the funny thing is, I actually wrote that probably the most challenging thing has been the, the confidence. So I think <laughs> sort of, um, I think kind of, I think I basically have had a bit of an imposter syndrome. Um, but particularly when, when CAST started out, our research centre, we got the funding, well, about four years ago. And um, and it was the first sort of really big leadership position that I'd had. Um, and I really just didn't feel very equipped for it because it was also, as well as sort of leading a large group of people, it put me in the public spotlight a lot. And I was getting contacted by sort of, you know, senior people in business and, and policy and um, and elsewhere and asked to kind of give talks and do loads of other things. And sometimes I just felt like I don't have all the answers here. Like you're coming to me saying you've declared a climate emergency and you really want to like engage your staff and you want to do all these other things. and how do you do that? And I do not do not necessarily have all the answers that you need. And I could sort of, in the end, I think I sort of realized, well, actually, if I can say, this is what I do know, and we have good evidence about this, this and this, and we can help you collect some more evidence to support what you want to do. I think that's, I, I've sort of reconciled myself to that's probably what I should be, you know, that's what I can say. And I don't necessarily have to have all the answers, but it, but in, at least initially, it sort of seemed like, my God, I just, I can't do this. Like they're expecting so much and I feel like really out of my depth. So um, I think that imposter syndrome, to be honest, is probably one of the biggest 
challenges and um I'm sort of like feeling a bit more confident now um than I used to be but I it's it's taken a while I think to just sort of think that actually maybe nobody really knows what they're doing and it's just about kind of portraying an air of confidence <laughs> well I'm sure there's an element of truth in that in most most people's work isn't there um so you're obviously part of the community here at Portsmouth High School we think it is unique um what's your fondest memory of your time here um, I made some absolutely amazing friends. Um, so my best friend at the high school, Sam Ship, as she was then, is still my best friend, Sam Davis now, who you know from GDST, her, her work with you. And yeah. she was so kind to nominate me for the GDST Alumna of, um, of the Year Award last year. And I just was bowled over by that as a gesture and I although I didn't win I got to go to a very lovely kind of event uh, award ceremony and um yeah and and I just sort of thought that's that's really lovely and so we've been really close for for many years and um so and actually I've made yeah lots of friends for life um I, I live very close to Jenny Allen as well who uh, I was great friends with at school and kept in touch with various other friends so I think it was the yeah the, the fact that I just made such brilliant friends was the main thing um, of course, um, I think, you know, it's a school that inspires as, um, aspirations and ambitions amongst young, young women. And so, you know, there was always this feeling like career, career wise, there are no limits. So whatever you're interested in, you can just go for it, just work for it. And you can, you can sort of go for it and, and achieve it. And I don't think that's obviously, that's not inevitable in, in sort of, in, in other schools. I think GDST really, you know, does encourage young women to aim high, that there's no job that's unsuitable for a woman. You know, I, I just, it didn't even occur to us, I think, that like there might be a sort of a particular type of job that, you know, would be, you know, for for, for us. It was like anything, anything you want to do. So I think that's absolutely wonderful. That's a real gift that we've been given. And I think the sort of the challenges that like now reflecting on that, I realized like I was in a huge sort of position of privilege to go to a school like that. And I think the challenge is obviously about leveling the playing field because not everybody has that fantastic head start. And I think obviously DDST does lots around sort of bursaries. I think more widely, there's probably a need for private schools to really engage with communities in meaningful ways that kind of share, share those benefits. And I think I just need to also can sort of constantly I guess recognize my my background of privilege because I think having a first class education as I did I was incredibly lucky and I sort of need to be aware that it's contributed to to some of the opportunities I've had so yeah I I am constantly grateful for for yeah those opportunities I've had from from the school. I think it's quite reassuring that if I was to ask our most recent leavers they'd probably give the same answer actually friends um, the fact that we believe in that they can do anything, be anything, there's no, nothing off limits that they can rise to wherever they want to be, whatever they choose for that to be, yeah. um, I think is still very much the ethos of the school. But I think, and it and it's funny because you'd think sort of we've come so far in terms of gender equality, but there are still areas where we need to make progress. And like, so I have young children in, in primary school and you'd think by their age, they wouldn't have like gender stereotypes, but actually they come home and say like, oh, it turns out that women can do this or like, oh, that's not a job for, and I think like, oh my goodness, you're, you're like six or seven and you're saying these things. And like, we, I mean, I was aware of some of those things, but like we were never really, it never felt like an impediment in, in the school, but like they still exist. And so we still need to challenge those. So I think there's still a role for, obviously you know working on gender issues basically but it's um it, it it's it's slightly disheartening that still that there's 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 a way to go oh there absolutely is so if you held a fantasy dinner party who would your three <laughs> guests be and why oh do you know i <laughs> it's just this was quite a challenging thought exercise actually because i sort of thought well there's loads of people that i sort of think are brilliant but i don't know if they'd be good conversationalists you know sort of you know people that you like to sort of see on the screen but um so here are my top three a uh, bit of a random mixture number one Agatha Christie I mean she's just my favorite author she's amazing uh so I'd love to just sort of chat to her about you know who inspired her work who's her favorite out of Poirot and Marple um but also you know what's what was it like sort of being a woman in a man's world and like really so she was doing things which were not normal in a way for a woman at that time and so she and so successful and such an enduring legacy so she'd be amazing to chat to um 
Stella Rimmington, uh, turns out, ex-GDST, isn't she? Um, so she's pretty inspiring. I mean, like, talk about doing a job in a, like, really in a male-dominated profession. She's like, the in terms of sort of head of MI5, and that sort of world must be, like, incredibly intimidating, hugely pressured. And some of the secrets she'd have to, like, have, like, I'd just love to sort of, off the record, ask her about some of the, you know, what were the hardest decisions she had to make? What was it like making friends with the KGB operatives and things like that? And... So yeah, and again, sort of what what's what what were the sort of the gender issues that she faced? So she'd be quite cool to to invite. Um, and then I thought, sort of as a contrast, given that you know we'd be chatting about sort of murders and espionage, maybe Brian Blessed just to lighten the tone because he is hilarious, absolutely hilarious. And so why well, why not? He'd just be so entertaining, I think. Well, I'd like to be a guest at that dinner party, I think, actually, because uh, as the girls here know, um, when I was at school, I wanted to be a spy. So I, I'd be quite interested in Stella Room. I felt I was halfway there um, towards James Bond, anyway, with the name Jane. I just didn't have the surname <laughs> Bond. And Agatha Christie, I'm always recommending her as an author to our younger year seven, year eight, who are very, very into crime because they're they're good tales they're good stories that still applicable today but there's nothing too violent about them in in a funny sort of way even though they're about murder they're not too gory I think is oh the exactly and there's and you know and they always make time for just a civilized cup of tea don't they I mean it's yes. all very it's all very yeah. civilized despite the, the murders and things so yeah it's very sort of gentle but um but yeah but page turners absolutely just really gripping stuff and I was in a hotel once and Brown Blessed was there with a group of people having coffee and everybody was guffawing with laughter. So, yes, I very much like to be part of that. I'd love to have known what they were they were laughing about. So before we wrap up, is there a message you'd like to leave with girls who are at school today who may be considering a, a career in environmental psychology or just young women in the world? Well, I mean, I definitely think recognise your privilege because you are so lucky to be having such a fantastic um, education um, and, you know, use your brilliant skills and, and education for good in the world. Um, and if you're interested, particularly in something like climate change, there are millions of careers. There are just the, the career options for sort of the green economy, working in the environment and climate are really expanding. I mean, it's all going to be kind of moving in that direction. So look at sort of what interests you and think, you know, how can I sort of advance um, a sort of, you know, net zero transition or, or thinking about sort of uh, low carbon energy or whatever in that context so there's lots of opportunities and I think yeah environmental psychology if you're into sort of how people tick and the, and the human side of things this is a really growing area in, in psychology in particular and if you want your research to make a difference I think just make it um, get it out there put it in the public domain disseminate it on social media or wh wherever you can basically um, and the more you get to your research um, publicised, the more it will be picked up and the more you will get invited to then sort of speak to people that make decisions. So I'd say if you're interested in research, make it research that is publicly available, it's out there, it can be used. Yeah, it's easier in some ways, isn't it, for young people today to use social media, which is something we've all learned as we've go, gone along. But that is one way that you can certainly get your message out there and uh, get yourself noticed when girls come and I, I see them and we're talking about careers and careers advice and so on. One of the things, if they want to be writers or they want to be leaders in a particular area, as I always say, start a blog. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, attract the interests of people who will share your particular area exactly. absolutely yeah I think that's right because I think what what we find is that people that sort of come come across our centers work that we haven't you know that we don't know they said you know well we just googled it and we found that you've just done this public talk or you know you were um that you just tweeted about your latest research and stuff and so that is how people find you so yeah absolutely use those tools so thank you so much for giving up your valuable time today to speak to me, Lorraine. Uh, what an inspiration, inspiration worldwide, globally, but particularly here in school. So remember, please come back and visit us. We would love to see you next time you're passing Portsmouth High School. And we wish you all the best in your continuing success. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>